we are um, so thrilled to have Dr. Loma Waima come to talk to us. I'm, uh, my name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. I'm with the uh, Oral History Research Program housed here at the library. And we've been involved in a collaborative uh, project with the Shilako National Alumni Association for a couple of years. And that's how we initially ran across Dr. Loma Waima's book. They called it Prairie Light which is about Shilako, based on her interviews with Shilako alumni, and she has very personal connections to this story. But she comes to us from Arizona State University, where she teaches in American Indian Studies, and I'd like you to help me welcome her to the podium. Um, as someone from, let's see, turn on this one. Um, as someone from a drought-stricken state, it's really, really wonderful to see rain. So it's, it's a great blessing. Um, and I thank you for that. Welcome back to the state of Oklahoma. <coughs> I'm going to start today with a story that my dad told me. Um, that's my dad. Curtis Thorpe Carr there um, on your left um, in his high school graduation picture. Um, so squirrels, my dad once told me, love hard candy. And you might think, oh gosh, what an acute observer of nature. <laughs> but as a kid, I was like, hard candy, okay dad, how do you know that? And he told this story uh, from his childhood growing up at Shilako Indian School. So at Shilako in the spring, the boys would climb up into the top of the tallest trees into big shaggy nests of leaves and they would capture squirrel babies for pets. And you all probably know this because you're from Oklahoma, but in Oklahoma, there's a semi-rare color sport of black squirrels. And my dad and his best friend, Charlie, were among the squirrel-holding elite at Shilako because they knew where the black squirrel nests were, and they always had black squirrel babies for pets. And that made them special. You're special. This was not something that most Indian children at Indian boarding schools ever heard. The schools, after all, and this is the original building built in 1884 at Shilako, the schools were designed, in fact, to teach and tell Indian children how not special they were. Every hour of every day of every week, of week after week, year after year, away from home and from family. Now, the candy that squirrels like is um, what my dad called an all-day sucker. I think we would call it lollipops these days. Um, hard and shiny as glass. And my dad told me, the little squirrel curled up in my shirt pocket, the boys' work shirts. During the day, and every so often, the little squirrel would poke its head out and demand a piece of broken up all day sucker. I wonder what that felt like to have the warm young squirrel curled up in the pocket over your heart. Only young squirrels. Only young squirrels. You couldn't keep them, my dad said. Squirrels are wild animals after all. You can't tame them. The day would always come when the squirrel was ready to go back to the tall trees along Shilako Creek to the Catalpa Grove. And the boys would always let them go. Back they went. I wonder, was that part of the appeal? To be a temporary squirrel holder for a few weeks out of the long year and see the squirrel go free, even when you couldn't. Squirrels, my dad told me, love hard candy. And my dad loved candy, too. 
especially chocolate covered cherries. And I wonder when and where did my dad ever first taste a chocolate covered cherry? Now, it may seem odd to you to start a talk about Indian boarding schools with a question about chocolate covered cherries. But this question rises up out of my dad's stories. And lately, how I have begun to think and feel about those stories um, in perhaps new ways, realizing that the entertaining childhood stories that my dad told my sister and me as we were growing up carry some very deep lessons about what it meant to be a child in this institutional environment, the Federal Indian Boarding School system, which was a school, but was also a very particular kind of prison. Now, in the 1920s, uh, my grandmother, Cora Wanima Carr, Moose Creek, um, was living in Wichita, Kansas. And a judge in Wichita at that time judged her incompetent to raise her children. <clears throat> After all, she was a native woman. She had three children. She did not have a husband. He had deserted the family. Um, and that was grounds enough in the eyes of the social workers and the court. So my dad was about nine years old in 1927 when the courts sent him and his older brother um, down to Shilako, a federal off-reservation Indian boarding school um, right on the Kansas-Oklahoma state line, just almost straight north of Stillwater. Um, I'm assuming some of you might know that campus. <clears throat> and my dad was there. Um, he did not see his mother again, so he was nine when he went in. He did not see his mom again until he was probably around age 14 and 15, or 15 when he um, first started going AWOL, absent without leave. In other words, he ran away um, because he wanted to see his mom again. So Shilako Indian Agricultural School was built in 1884 when scientific and popular opinion were converging on the notion of racial hierarchy, certainly on white supremacy. And the US was working in a whole variety of ways to criminalize um, native religions, certainly native languages, cultures, social life, and also working quite actively to suppress or erase uh, indigenous sovereignty. In extreme but not really unusual cases or examples um, pertaining to education, uh, Hopi men were incarcerated at Alcatraz uh, for refusing to enroll their children in school. Uh, in a case I encountered in the Federal Archives, a young pregnant Paiute woman who'd been caught playing cards on a Sunday uh, was locked up in the agency jail on the orders of the agent and assigned hard labor digging up cottonwood stumps. Now, it's important to keep in mind that these punishments were not imposed by any officer of the court or of a police force. These powers were, or punishments, were imposed by bureaucrats employees of the Office of Indian Affairs, later what becomes the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And this is really important to understand that the powers of the federal government over the last several centuries, the powers of the federal government imposed on native peoples, both nations and individuals, have to a remarkably large degree not been laws. They've been bureaucratic orders. And that's an important difference because it means it's not reviewable by any court. bureaucracy has its own powers in this country. And so in a very real sense, these powers of the federal government over native people have operated in a very real sense outside the law. So my dad's case in, in, in this instance is a little bit unusual in being placed at Shilako by court order. Um, in most cases, native children who are removed from families were removed under um, regulatory orders under the Bureau of Indian Affairs like the Browning ruling. But it's important to res remember that families who resisted, like these Hopi men, were subject to incarceration and some very strict um, punishments. Now, many questions rise up <clears throat> when we think about Indian boarding schools and Indian people and Indian nations and the United States. <clears throat> 
and probably the question, Dad, when did you first taste a chocolate-covered cherry? <laughs> is not the first question that pops to mind. It was certainly not the first question that came to my mind in 1984 when I interviewed my dad and uh, about 65 of his peers and compatriots, uh, alumni and survivors of Shalako Indian School. Um, of course, I had grown up with my dad's stories, um, as children do. You know, you hear stories of your parents' childhood. Um, I, as many children do, thought our family was normal, a <laughs> common delusion. Um, but I realized over time that, you know, there were things I believed about my dad, that my dad was brilliant and loving and handsome, and he was all of those things. But compared to the other fathers of the other children in the mostly white public schools that I attended all around the Midwest, um, you couldn't say that his upbringing was normal. And I was probably in my teens before I began to realize the character of the institution that he had survived and the ways in which it had impacted him as a child, as an adult, the ways in which it impacted the structure of our family. Um, and I was at least in my 20s before I began to realize that his brother Bob had not survived that uh, system. But honestly, the story about chocolate-covered cherries did not occur to me until 4 a.m. last September 28th, when I came bolt upright, out of sleep, went to my computer, and sat down and started to write about my dad's stories, about Shalako, about alumni, um, in ways that I had just simply not done before. So that's fall 1984 to fall 2017. That's <clears throat> 33 years. Uh, about five and a half years after my dad passed away. What took me so long, you might well ask. Um, a failure of imagination, perhaps, of how to break out of a mode of academic thinking, um, possibly a failure of courage. Um, but Indian boarding school stories are inspiring, Frequently funny, nearly always heartbreaking. Stories ignite raucous laughter and spilled tears. Stories are quiet, reserved, kept to oneself. Stories are sometimes never, ever told. Stories, I think, nestle in a pocket over our heart until the day they poke their head out and say, feed me, remember me, think about me, tell me. And then the questions rise up. Not just questions about Shalako, about Indian schools and Indian children and Indian nations in the United States, but questions how do we listen, how do we remember, how do we tell in ways that are accurate, respectful, humane, engaging both intellect and emotion. So today I want to invite you to think about stories and to think about images like these, um, including some really famous um, what are called before and after photographs uh, that were taken at Carlisle Indian School by a photographer by the name of John Choate. And <clears throat> Here's some Apache before and after photographs. Now, as my father's daughter, you might say I've been thinking about Indian boarding schools all of my life, but I, I didn't start to study them um, until 1983, 1984. And since then, I've been just amazed by this remarkably rich photographic archive that the federal government very intentionally produced <clears throat> to document the schools document their architecture, their disciplinary strategies, classrooms, dining halls, workshops, fields, everything, in a really massive public relations campaign to convince the US public, I don't know, maybe themselves as well, of this good work that they were doing to civilize this uncivilized indigenous presence. To transform Indian children from savage to civilized to become at least potentially, maybe, citizens of a nation that had divested 
native nations of land, of prosperity, and eventually even children. The campaign advertised a supposedly benevolent paternalism of a caring guardian, the federal government, for its benighted and bereft wards, those Indian people and Indian children. Now, you might ask, where did that idea come from? Federal guardian, Indian ward. And this man is responsible for that, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, John Marshall. In this um, landmark dicta, I'll explain that in a second, 1831 Cherokee Nation v. Georgia. So this is all about removal, right? What led up to the Trail of Tears. And the Cherokee Nation's trying to resist everything that's happening to it in the state of Georgia for being pushed out. And they take a case to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court's faced with the question, can the Cherokee Nation file a case in the Supreme Court of the United States of America? And so when you're faced with a question like that, of course, the justices turn to the US Constitution because the US Constitution spells out who can bring cases. Individual citizens can. Uh, Cherokee Nation's not an individual citizen. States can. That uh, doesn't work. Foreign nations can. That was the question. Is the Cherokee Nation a foreign nation? So the court's trying to figure out, can we hear this case? And John Marshall has a fertile legal imagination, and he creates a legal fiction, an idea, that the answer is no. And along the way, he says, the relationship between Indian people and the federal government resembles, resembles the relationship between a ward and a guardian. Not is the relationship. Sort of, kind of, maybe looks like it. But that resemblance was and remains immensely convenient to federal agendas. And so it has become almost instantly after 1831 entrenched as an absolute certitude as dogma in federal Indian law. I said dicta. This is not a Supreme Court decision because they never heard the case. It's just his opinion about why they couldn't hear the case. These legal distinctions um, have great import in Indian country. Fast forward, though, by the early 1900s, federal powers as guardians over Indian wards are almost completely unchecked. And as I said, there's very little ability even for court review. And so the federal government feels fully justified to institutionalize Indian children in the name of civilization. So those before and after photographs then are staple weapons in this arsenal of images. These images propose to tell a certain story that native people are savages, they are benefiting from federal guardianship and institutionalization in these schools. And these two photographs, I think, taken by Choate at Carlisle, are, in my estimation, the most um, widely reproduced both in their day right up to the present time. So by my scholarly, scholarly estimation, these images have been reproduced about a billion times. I mean, lots and lots and lots. Tom Torlino, Diné Navajo student. Documentary films, book covers, museum exhibits, chapters, books, these images are everywhere. Trust me, try to Google them. It's amazing. So these images told their viewers you know, a new haircut, new clothes called citizen dress, new habits of military bearing, these kind of on the surface characteristics tell us that this individual has been completely transformed. No longer a primitive savage, but a civilized and Christian American. Now, it wasn't entirely true, but it was a really effective public relations message. We know, though, um, that the schools, although they wielded many powers over Indian children, um, Indian children brought their own resources and their own strengths to the table. Tom Torlino came to Carlisle as a young Diné man. And when he returned home, he was still Diné. Scholar Farina King, who I'm so happy is in the audience. Hi, Farina. <laughs> Dr. King teaches right over here at Northeastern State. Um, and she found, in doing her dissertation on schooling on Navajo Nation, she found an interview that had been done with Tom Torlino's um, daughter, right? Son. Son. 
Uh, oh boy, I got a mistake on my paper. So glad you're here. <clears throat> and so this interview had been done years after Torlino had returned home, and, and this is what his family said. He could put on a suit when he needed to, but he was just as comfortable in traditional Navajo clothing. When he returned to his home in Coyote Canyon, he picked up his career as a rancher and medicine man right where he had left off. He served as an intermediary between the United States and Navajos using his background in English to assist Diné leaders such as his uncle, Manuelito, in their correspondence with the federal government. So Torlino's life then after Carlisle puts the lie to the myth that those photos propose to tell us. And in thinking again um, in the last year or so about these photographs, I came to realize that our family archive also contains before and after photographs. But our before and after photographs put the lie to another myth of the US government, the myth of the benevolent guardian taking care of the benighted, uncivilized ward. Now, there's only actually um, three photographs in the world of my dad uh, as a child, as a kid, <clears throat> and I'll show you two of them. This first photo was taken in Wichita. My guess is this is about 1926. I think it's not long before the boys were sent to Shalako. Um, the tall girl on the left is possibly a neighbor's child. Honestly, Dad never could remember who that was. Um, and then in the middle is Bob, Robert. Um, he's cradling the cheeks of their younger sister, Betty. And that's my dad, uh, Curtis, Kurt on the right. Um, they were still in the care of their mother, who was um, by that time on her own and, and struggling to take care of her kids uh, in Wichita. Um, my dad always thought that um, Betty, Betty was not sent to Shalako. My dad had always thought that she'd been brought up by their mom, um, but he actually learned in the 1980s that um, Betty had been deemed too young for the Indian school, so she was placed in the Wichita orphanage. Um, and my grandmother worked there in the laundry. She was the laundress at the orphanage, so it's possible that she and Betty got to see one another. Um, anyway, I've come to think of this as the before photograph in my dad's boarding school story. Um, and so we see three clean, well cared for children dressed obviously in their Sunday best for some kind of special occasion. Uh, the boys are scowling, uh, slightly squinting into the sunlight, um, possibly annoyed as boys might be and having to keep their clean white shirts clean and put on a tie and their hair slicked down. Um, the after photo shows a very different image. It's Shalako, it's a Saturday morning. Um, the few free hours that the boys had on their own to try and escape, escape the surveillance of school staff, run outdoors, play along Shalako Creek. Um, so this couple uh, from Wichita, these were apparently friends of my grandmother's. They were traveling down to Oklahoma they um, promised her that they would stop by Shalako and, and try and find the boys and, and take a picture of her boys for her. Um, Bob couldn't be found, but somehow or another they tracked my dad down. <clears throat> and this is no government produced public relations photograph showcasing a clean, well cared for child in GI, government issued clothing. Um, Kurt is dirty, ragged, and barefoot, and I have never in over 30 years of this work seen another photo that shows this truth of the boarding school the unstaged, unvarnished, uncomplimentary truth of how the federal guardian cared or failed to care for its wards. Now, <clears throat> dad went to Shalako um, with his older brother, Bob, Robert. Um, Bob, my dad said, was pretty ornery. And of all the frequently repeated and, and frequently really funny stories that my dad told about Shalako, um, he only told my sister and me um, Bob's story once, or maybe twice, um, we remembered it. Uh, one day, my dad said, one day Bob got to teasing one of the mules that we used uh, to plow the fields at Shalako, and mules being too smart to put up with that kind of nonsense, this one kicked Bob in the head, laid him out cold. Bob was never the same after that, he said. He'd been ornery before, but now he just turned nasty mean. About 1928, 1929, Bob was expelled from Shalako for what they called incorrigible behavior, which, believe you me, was quite an accomplishment in those days. 
As a scholar, um, I focused on the history of the off-reservation boarding school system. Trust me, very, very, very few children escaped Indian boarding school by being expelled. My dad never talked much about Bob, who died about age 20, 21, I reckon, while he was incarcerated at Leavenworth Prison, State Prison at Leavenworth, Kansas. My dad told lots of stories about Shalako, though. I mean, after all, it was the place, as tough as it was, where he was from. It's the place he spent his childhood. My dad's stories were central to the book, what Julie mentioned. Um, they called it Prairie Light. But it was four years after that book was published that I realized I never named Bob. I knew Bob was there, but I helped render him a ghost. But Bob occupied a place. He occupied a place in the history of Shalako, in the structure of my family, in my dad's heart, mind, and sense of self. My dad's brother's name was Robert Carlyle Carr. And my dad continued the story. After Shalako, Bob did bad things. I always felt like our mom liked him best, though, maybe because of the way I looked. I asked my mom once, what did our dad look like? And she said, if you're walking down the street someday and you see a man that looks exactly like you, that's your dad. When Bob got sick at Leavenworth, they sent him to the hospital in Kansas City. And when he died, Mom really wanted to know what had happened, so she asked me to go and find out. I was just a teenager, but I got there. I went from Wichita. I found the doctors, but they wouldn't talk to me. Just an Indian kid, what did they care? They said something about a rare blood disease, and I just assumed they meant syphilis. Now, at this point in our story, to consider Indian children and Indian schools and Indian nations in the United States of America, we need to take a step back or up or over or something for a little bigger context, a little bigger perspective. And we need to consider a really big question. This is the question that every discussion of American Indians in the United States must begin with. What does it mean that the U.S. is built on Indian land? What does that mean? Every square inch that undergirds U.S. sovereignty, U.S. national identity of nations and of citizens, of U.S. prosperity, every inch of it, native land. And for you know, huge chunks of that real estate, huge chunks, there was never clean transfer of title. Not even by U.S. legal and moral principles. We're not even going by indigenous principles. If we go by U.S. principles, we do not have clean transfer of title. Now, that is at the root of what has been called over the years the Indian problem, which is the problem that there's still Indians and that we have refused to fade into the historical sunset as U.S. mythology would really like us to do. That's tough. Our mere presence is a constant threat at some level, I think, some deeply unsettling level. It's threatening to a secure sense of a justified entitlement to national territory, to the land, to national identity, to U.S. sovereignty itself. And I think that motivates then a lot of what we can see in the establishment of institutions like Indian schools or even reservations as systems of containment. How do you contain threats? And here you can think about a whole variety of threats, criminals, um, infectious diseases, so-called deviants, lately terrorists. There's very similar principles and practices of containment that the U.S. mobilizes. Military power, for example, confine native people to reservations or to schools. Institutions under bureaucratic control, remember, not subject to legal protections or legal review. The agent or the superintendent or the prison warden's word is law. And boarding school students then were subjected to punishing physical military discipline, 
clothed in GI uniforms, marched in close order drill, identified by rank and number, instructed in rudimentary academics in a curriculum that stressed manual labor, domestic labor, and subservience to authority. So the rhetoric of the schools was we are creating self-sufficient, self-directing individuals in the Thomas Jeffersonian iconic ideal. And every single practice of the school puts the lie to that rhetoric. They were producing or aiming to produce strictly controlled individuals who would be subservient to authority. But the grandest plans can be put asunder, as they say, um, even by children. And Shalaka was also a school. It was also a home to children. And it became home, an inadequate substitute for home, but it became home to hundreds, in fact, thousands of children who were smart and resourceful and resilient and resistant, dedicated to one another, and much, much more than just victims. Their stories of friendship, and laughter, camaraderie, even happiness carved out of Shalako's institutional life, that demands our intention too. So I'll close this with one more story. I call this story the Night of the Japanese Lanterns. So the boy's life at Shalako was ruled by the disciplinarians. These are the men who are in charge of controlling <clears throat> 400, more than 400, at the height of enrollment, five to 600 Indian boys, teenagers, and young men. That's a daunting proposition. Parents in the room might think about that, 500 teenagers. <laughs> so that need to control mobilized Shalako's military discipline, uh, sorted the students into military companies, housed them in numbered dormitories. And in those respects, Shalako very much resembled uh, a prison. And the matrons and the disciplinarians then were in the guard towers, literally. <clears throat> the disciplinarian here, the boys called the Black Panther. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. I mean, they released that film just for me. <laughs> At Shalako, that's the Black Panther. <clears throat> Not quite the same look, what can you say? But the Black Panther stalked the boys climbing the water tower with his binoculars to spy on them, especially on Saturdays, those few free hours when they're out in the fields and the pastures and in their little uh, shacks they built along Shalako Creek, um, assuming they were not on a Saturday working off demerits at the rock pile, as they said, making little ones out of big ones. But anyway, this is actually not a story about the Black Panther. <clears throat> this is a story about a big man the boys called Hippo. Now, Hippo and other employees um, lived in small cottages. They were required to live on the school grounds. Um, single teachers in a, in a dormitory, uh, married couples in these little cottages. <clears throat> and one warm Saturday evening, Hippo was hosting a garden party in the backyard of his little um, cottage. So imagine food piled up on the picnic tables and Japanese lanterns strung uh, over the tree branches. It was Saturday night. And so that meant the boys had had all day to plan their mischief. Um, and so there was a very elaborate and ongoing flouting of authority at Shalako through pranks and practical jokes and sabotage uh, that was called tricksing in Shalako student slang, tricksing. So Shalako was um, an agricultural school, eight, 10,000 acres. Uh, that production ge uh, generated revenue because congressional appropriations never um, covered school costs. So there's a large cattle herd, there's um, big barns with turkey and, and chicken flocks, I guess you say, um, fruit orchards, pastures, uh, grain fields. And the boys um, would plow behind these draft horse and mule teams. Shalaka, of course, was also a federal uh, facility, so they, um, often received supplies, cast off uniforms, hard tack rations and the like from the US military. And recently the cavalry had uh, retired, I guess you'd say, some battle trained cavalry horses to Shalako. The boys seized the opportunity. It was Saturday night. 
My dad's gang of mixed blood Creek and Cherokee troublemakers slipped out the dorm window of home two and snuck over to the barn. The boys all loved to ride, but those draft horses and mules were not much fun. But strong, fast cavalry horses was a mighty temptation. Guerrilla horseback riders shunned bridles and saddles. They just looped a halter rope around the horse's jaw, and they were off. The horses, of course, were as enthusiastic as the boys to get out of the barn, and they rocketed down the loop road that circled Shalako's small lake. Now, at the corner where those employee cottages were clustered, the road dog-legged to the left. But the horses did not. These were cavalry horses. They were trained to charge into battle. They weren't going to be deterred by a garden party. The cavalry charged straight ahead. Ragged, barefoot Indian boys hanging on for dear life. Right through Hippo's garden party and those strong, fast cavalry horses launched themselves over the picnic tables. Disciplinarians, matrons, teachers, farmers scattering in every direction like terrified chickens. At this point in the story, my dad would yell, it was the charge of the light brigade. <laughs> I cherish that image. My dad and his gang brothers, fierce, passionate, unloved Indian boys, sailing across the night sky, looking down at those astonished, upturned faces as their powerful steeds vaulted over the picnic tables and pounded away into the night, strings of gently lit Japanese lanterns trailing from their shoulders. Not exactly the stereotypical image of Indian warriors on horseback. <laughs> but warriors, I think, nonetheless. And I wonder, what did that feel like? Did that feel like freedom? My dad was brilliant and loving and handsome. He was full of fun and laughter and jokes. He also always carried anger towards his mom, feeling that she had abandoned them. So when I asked him in 1983, Dad, what would you think about trying to do an oral history of Shalako? He first said, that's a great idea. And then he said, be prepared to hear some hard stories. And I can give no better advice to anyone interested in learning about Indian boarding schools. These are important stories. Be prepared to learn some hard truths. And I thank you for your attention. Um, yes, yeah, so I thought oh, we would take some questions for sure. Dr. Loma Lima. Yeah. Uh, no, there's two PhD programs in, in, I'm actually not in American Indian Studies at ASU, but there are two PhD programs in the U.S., one uh, down the road from us at University of Arizona, and then one at UC, UC University of California, Davis. Um, and I hear UCLA has one in the in the pipeline, in the works. Hmm? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. There's more MA. There's more MA programs than um, PhD programs. Thanks for your. Any anything else? Really, not a single person's going to ask about the swastika. This is a first. That has never happened before. I came prepared. <laughs> So this is apparently a very common iconographic thing in human cultures over space and over time. And it was picked as the Shalako um, emblem or logo early, early, early on. I honestly don't know when. Um, and it was everywhere. Like it was over the arch, it was in the um, 
this is uh, the administration building. It was in mosaics in the floor. It was in Navajo rugs that were used to decorate the building. Of course, then World War II came and burned the rugs, chipped the mosaics out, <laughs> cut the, oh. So if you go out to the exhibit um, on, in the panel about Shalako, you'll see a picture from World War II of that same arch, but uh, the swastika on top's been cut off. It's no longer there. Okay, so I just had to say that because you're the first audience that never said, what about that swastika thing? <laughs> the end. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jim Baker. Um, he is a um, former administrator of Shalako. He has his master's degree, I hope I get the university, uh, Pennsylvania State University, and served in the military for a number of years as well. And he's been involved, deeply involved with the Shalako National Alumni Association. We're happy to have several members from that here today. And sort of the um, official historian of Shalako, and especially with regard to its military aspects. Thank you, uh, Julie. If my mom could only see me now, she'd be wondering, what in the world are you doing up there? <laughs> I'm beginning to wonder that myself, but it's an honor to be here, and I want to uh, thank uh, Julie for working, uh, you know, with us and and uh, exposing Shalako in the manner that you know we are doing. And uh, you know, Shalako is a legacy in Indian education. Uh, it put Indian education, I think, on the map. I often wonder why people are interested in Indian boarding schools, especially when in fact there are over 500 elementary, secondary boarding schools, non-Indian boarding schools located throughout the United States. Yet, with 62 boarding schools at one time, now down to about 32 Indian boarding schools around the country, still an interest on you know what goes on at these various uh, boarding schools throughout the country. Of course, before I get into that, let me uh, introduce some friends that uh, I have with me. Uh, I say I have with me. They're here, uh, Shalaka ones, uh, Betty Pino. Uh, she is our uh, publicity for the Alumni Association and a uh, graduate. Uh, and of course, my wife, Charmaine, uh, she is a 1962 graduate of uh, Shalako and also a member of the uh, Shalako Board of Directors, Mr. Bill Pino. Uh, uh, he is uh, one of the Pueblos from uh, New Mexico area. I am a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Any Choctaws in here? One. Okay. That's a start. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there'd be about 30 or 40 hands coming up, but uh, there are a number of Choctaws that live uh, in the Stillwater area, and uh, I can attest to that because every time I see a policeman giving somebody a ticket. He's got a Choctaw tag on their car. <laughs> Shalako, as I mentioned, uh, you know, is a legacy. Uh, when I graduated there in 1960, uh, I often wondered uh, why I even ended up at Shalako. I was living the good life of a high school uh, life of a high school dropout. And finally, uh, the farmer I was working for in Lubbock, Texas, uh, talked me into uh, coming back and 
get him back to school. So I took his word and uh, came back to school. But the experience that I gained from those two years probably is what got me back into uh, school. Uh, it wasn't the best life that uh, you know I experienced. Uh, it was an adventure, I will say that, because the first time I made a little bit of, uh, got a little cash in my hand, uh, my friend and I bought a motorcycle. And we decided to uh, hit the road. You've seen that movie, Easy Rider. I think we were the forerunners to that movie because we hit the road and we went around the United States. And if we ran out of money, we would stop and, and maybe work in some kind of a harvest, make a little money and, you know, for gas. And we spent a lot of nights in uh, roadside parks or city parks. But that was an experience that uh, I don't know if I would uh, say uh, I wouldn't trade for it, but uh, it was an experience. And eventually, coming back to school, you know, was the greatest experience that I, you know, have ever garnered. Even though I went back to Clayton uh, Public School for my, uh, finished my sophomore year, it was not the same. The kids that I grew up with were two years ahead of me. They were seniors. They were graduating that year. And when they graduated, instead of going back for my junior year, I decided to uh, try Sherlocko. Some of my friends from back home had attended Sherlocko, and, <clears throat> and uh, they told me how great of a school it was, how they enjoyed it, and I gave it a try. The best decision I ever made to be honest with you. <clears throat> it is not, it was not the school that you so often read about, the negative aspect of a boarding school. People write about boarding schools, but oftentimes it's the negative, the drama that they write about. Because I, I understand it, that sells books. or. If it were a movie, it would, you know, sell tickets. It was almost boring, to be honest with you, but we had a good time. The notoriety of Sherlocko, let me uh, just give you a little, uh, some highlights on the notoriety of Sherlocko. Julie Gilstrap attended Sherlocko. Anybody know about Julie Gilstrap? Good. Now I can tell you about her. <laughs> she is the stepdaughter of Emmett Dalton. Anybody know about Emmett Dalton? Well, let me tell you about Emmett Dalton then. Emmett Dalton was a part of the Dalton gang, the outlaw gang, Coffeyville, Kansas books about him, read it. She was stepdaughter of Emmett Dalton. And she just died here recently, uh, an old woman. But one of the not uh, notorious Sherlock Owen. Junior Monsell, anybody ever hear of Junior Monsell? World champion boxer. Sherlock Owen was noted as a boxing school, one of its legacy. Boxers after boxers came out of Sherlocko. The best story I've heard about a Sherlocko boxer was a guy by the name of Charles Leclerc telling off on uh, Fred Underwood. Fred was a world champion boxer. Never been knocked down much less knocked out until one night they had gone 
AWOL, which is absent without leave from the campus, gone to the state line, they bought a sack full of hamburgers, was midnight, was taking it back to the dorm, and they were running down the road that you saw the picture of with the arch, and he ran into a road sign, dark of the night, knocked him out, that all you could hear was in the quiet of the night was just hamburgers and papers wrestling down the arch road there. But that was another notorious name from Sherlocko, Fred Underwood, undefeated 130-pound boxer. Joe Thornton. Okay, a few people have heard about Joe Thornton. He is a world champion archer. In fact, after the World Championship Games in which he won gold medals, he and his uh, wife-to-be won gold medals, he uh, was instrumental in getting archery into the Olympics. Luke Jimmy. Nobody's heard of Luke? Her classmate. No, I guess he was a year ahead of you. Brooklyn Dodgers baseball player. Lewis Curtis. I know nobody heard of Lewis Curtis. Eastland Mall in Tulsa. He, uh, the, uh, the big carpenter behind that, the big builder. Ernest Childers, Jack Montgomery, Congressional Medal of Honor winner, Sherlock graduate, World War II. Mike Hardin. No one has heard of Mike Hardin? Anybody have a Krispy Kreme donut this morning? He is the uh, founder and CEO of Krispy Kreme Donuts, or Krispy Kreme uh, I want to say donut shop, but it's not really a donut shop. You know, Krispy Kreme uh, pastry products. But he learned his trade at Chilocco and and went on to help co-find co the uh, Krispy Kreme organization and then retired in 1976 as the CEO. Beulah Pope, she was uh, the first person to join the newly formed Women's Army Corps, a Shalaku graduate. So we could go on and on with people of this type uh, to show you some of the legacies of Sherlocko. Sherlocko was a school that was ahead of its time. Why was it ahead of its time? Well, politics closed Sherlocko. When everybody else caught up with Sherlocko, then the political football game began to the extent that it was one of the uh, largest farms in the uh, Kay County area, and its products were out competing, you know, the local farming community. That was one element. And who from Kay County was in Washington at that time? Take a guess. I won't call any names, but uh, uh, he was instrumental in pushing the legislation that uh, took Shalako out of the picture. When I say it was ahead of its time, you saw in the, video, uh, in the slide all of those beautiful buildings. Those buildings were constructed from limestone that was quarried right on the campus. When Sherlocko was established, the name of the curriculum was actual work curriculum. What do we mean by actual work? 
Well, if you were going to take carpentry, learn carpentry, then you actually build, help build the buildings. That, so all of those buildings that you saw were constructed by students in actual work, in their actual work curriculum. The rock, the stones were quarried right there on campus by students. If you were taking plumbing, if you wanted to learn plumbing, you did all the plumbing in those newly constructed buildings. You did the painting. Electricity was scarce, but what electricity there was, you know, the students did the work. When I attended school there, there were 27 different vocational education programs. Very few high schools in Oklahoma at that time had vocational programs. There were uh, Shilako, another legacy of Shilako is that it was self-sustaining. A 5,800-acre farm where we had 500 head of registered Hereford uh, cattle, had about 80 purebred Morgan horses. We had sheep. We had swine. They were not the, the poultry product was uh, poultry program was closed when I got there as a student, but it was only a year before I got there that they closed that program. But we had our own poultry program. We had our own dairy program. Uh, they made their own ice cream, for example, with all the bacon that they did uh, on campus there. So it was self-sustaining. Very few purchases outside of the campus. And the students did the manual labor for everything that, you know, the school required. If there were activities on campus, they drew large crowds. A football game would draw a large crowd. A basketball game would draw a large crowd. I guess the biggest crowd, though, would be like my wife Charmaine had a fight at the girls' dorm that would draw the largest crowd. But a well-noted school in Indian country, the phrase that has been coined for Sherlocko is that it was a common ground for Indian country. One of the reasons uh, that phrase was coined was because at the time that we were working uh, with the Shilako Development Authority after the school closed, we looked at the number of tribal chairmen that were sitting in position around the country. The number of tribal council people that were in, the in office at the time that we were working on the uh, Shilako Development Program, and that's throughout the United States. We didn't have a lot of tribes represented at Shilako throughout its history. I think about 127 out of the 5,442 Shilakoans that graduated from school there, uh, 127 different tribes. But it was spread out across the United States. We have a tribal chairman that's in office today that is a Shilako graduate. Uh, his name is uh, Mitchell Cypress, Seminole tribe of Florida. And we have a number of tribal council people today who are Shilako graduates. For example, the vice chairperson of the Kaw Nation, she is a Shilako graduate. So common ground for Indian country is the phrase that I use for Shilako and that many of us use for Shilako Indian School. Now, let me get back to something that probably uh, a bigger legacy 
a larger legacy than some of the items that I've talked about, and that is the military. When we look at the number of Shalaku graduates that served in the military, at one point it was almost like 70 percent of our Shalaku graduates were in the military. And we wonder why, and then we look back, 1925, the uh, Oklahoma National Guard established a unit on campus, the only school in the country that had its own National Guard unit on campus. And it was open to people around the community, but 99% of the members were Shalaku students. And the unit commanders generally worked at Shalaku. So throughout its history on campus, st students were joining the National Guard unit for various reasons. I joined it because it was a way of earning money, getting a check, you know, every 90 days. And then when I graduated from Shalaku in 1960, of course, I went off to boot camp and eventually came back for another two years at Shalaku. But uh, the guard unit is one of the uh, legacies of Shalaku. Ernest Childers, a Congressional Medal of Honor winner, and Jack Montgomery, the other Congressional Medal of Honor winners, were members of that unit when it was activated during World War II. But taking that a step further, I'm sure you've heard of the Code Talkers. In World War II, three of the Navajo Code Talkers were Sholaco, uh, former Sholaco students. So that, you know, just adds to what I call the greatest legacy at Sholaco is the military aspect. But you take that a step further back. Sholaco initially was a highly regimented program. 27 bugle calls a day. Can you imagine putting up with that? And even the smallest child knew what ta -da, ta -da, they knew what that meant before they take off. But each of the 27 bugle calls was for a distinct purpose and everybody knew what that sound was for. And everybody in the morning would get out and stand in formation in the oval area. A lot of our current Shalako alumni don't even know that that oval would be full of students in formation in uniform until, they, of course, they see some of the older pictures and then they realize that, that yes, uh, Shalako was a highly regimented program. And then shortly after the Merriam report, things begin to change to a little bit more humanistic environment. And this is the era that I probably am most familiar with. And I was not, for example, made to stand in the corner or put soap in my mouth for talking my tribal language. There were a number of Choctaws there and we always you know, talked our language, talked our tribal language, but as I talked to some of the older people, of course they're now gone, I'm the old one. They are now gone, but they talk about the days when they were punished for, you know, trying to speak the language. A hundred percent of the Navajo students that were at Shalako, they spoke their language the only tribe I know of where the greatest number of uh, members, uh, you know, do speak the language. As a member of the Choctaw Nation, the last word I heard was that 75% of my tribal members are less than one quarter degree Indian, which means that I think it was like 17% or it might have been 7%, I can't remember, that speak the language. 
Fortunately, I still speak it. It's tough to carry on a conversation because I've been away from it so long, but, uh, but make me mad and I'll say something in Choctaw <laughs> that you can't understand. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Shalako closed in 1980 and at that time, we had a couple thousand alumni members still alive and active. Each year, we have an all-school reunion. This year, it is uh, May 31 through June the 2nd at the uh, First Council Casino north of Newkirk, just right off the uh, Shalako campus there. We generally have 250 to 300 people that will show up and attend, you know, the festivities there. The legacy, another legacy of Shalaku is that this alumni activity has been going on since the first graduating class in 1894. So this reunion has been going on since 1894. I spent a number of years as the president of the Alumni Association and uh, some wonderful experience working with uh, former students around the United States. And now I am the historian and I think I've learned a lot more about Shalako in the past two years as a historian because I'm constantly on the computer, uh, you know, looking at information or trying to dig up information. And so if you have an opportunity, come out May 31, June the 2nd of this next year. Visit the campus because we will have the campus gate open and Friday is generally a good day to visit because at that time we will have a free barbecue on campus. And of course, you're welcome to it. But more importantly, the cultural activities that take place. Afternoon of uh, Friday uh, at the uh, event center is the annual uh, Shalako uh, cultural activity, which includes a powwow and that is free to the public and everybody is welcome to attend. I, as I mentioned, am a graduate of Sholaku in 1960 and I guess my legacy is that I am the only Sholaku graduate to have ever become superintendent at Sholaku. But the sad thing about that is that I worked at Fort Sill Indian School, for example. They closed it down. I went to work at Concho Indian School. <laughs> they closed it down. I went to work for my first teaching job in Brigham City, Utah at Intermountain Indian School. They closed it down. I was the public school superintendent at Powhatan, uh, Kansas. They closed that down. Came to Shalako. They closed it down. Well, I went to Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, they didn't close it down. <laughs> But I did spend a number of good years uh, working around Indian country, Indian education. Got an opportunity to visit every Indian school in the United States. And that even paid for me to visit Indian schools in Maine. And I'd never been to Maine. Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, that area was one of the areas that I had never been to. But uh, 
visiting those Indian schools gave me the opportunity to visit that area. And as I mentioned a moment ago, over 500 boarding schools, non-Indian boarding schools in the United States. And it was surprising to learn that Massachusetts is the leader of boarding schools in this country. I think there's 37 boarding schools in Massachusetts, 27 in Connecticut, and then about 21, I think, in California. These are non-Indian boarding schools, and only 32 Indian boarding schools left. The beauty of this is that when I first went to Washington, there were 187 Indian schools that were funded by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Department of Interior in this country. 62 of them were boarding schools. In 1978, with the passage of, of Public Law 195561, uh, let me back up here, and then the passage of uh, uh, 95561, and then 10297, Public Law 10297. That allowed Indian tribes to take over these Indian schools. There are now 183 Indian schools throughout the United States. And 130 of these schools are now operated by tribes. Only 53, get my math correct here, uh, 53 are operated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Now there are six non-Indian boarding schools in Oklahoma. I don't know if, if you know that, but there are six non-Indian boarding schools in Oklahoma, specialty schools, I guess you could say. About four types of boarding schools that uh, exist in this country, other than you know your Indian boarding schools, and they are the, uh, the therapeutic uh, boarding schools, for example, and then there are uh, the specialty schools. The Oklahoma My Math and Science Academy, for example, is a specialty school, and you have to uh, compete to get accepted for that uh, in that program. As far as Indian schools, uh, we have five Indian schools, Indian boarding schools in Oklahoma, uh, still remaining, and that is at Sequoia, Tahlequah, Sequoia, Riverside Indian School in Anadarko. And then we have three dormitories, one at uh, Kingston called the Chickasaw Children's Village, and one at Eufaula, Eufaula Dorm, and the other one in Hartshorn, Jones Academy. So those are the Indian schools that we have left in this country. At the time of statehood, there were 25 Indian schools in Oklahoma. And, you know, Indian tribes valued, highly valued education. Now the problem, as you look back in history, you hear some of the negative stories that are told about boarding schools where the, let's call them Indian agents, went out to the Indian homes and forcefully took the children and brought them to a boarding school. I don't know if you know the reason why that happened. When treaties were established between the U.S. government and tribes, the tribe did not have the sophistication to require some conditions, which basically gave the government the authority to carry out the treaty obligations as they wished. Now, when I read some of the treaties that my tribe was involved with, our first boarding school, Choctaw Nation, was opened in uh, 1825. 
there were a few missionary boarding schools. And in 1825, the big one was established in Kentucky, away from the Choctaw Reservation, as we might call it. The conditions that the tribe established in the Treaty of uh, Washington, D.C. In, in the early uh, 1820s was that these schools would be established away from the Indian community so that those who were brought in from the outside to work in these schools would not live in the community and be influential uh, to the extent that maybe there would be some conflicts. And a lot of the tribes that had these types of treaties did not write some of these conditions into those treaties. So the major boarding school in 1825 that the Choctaw Nation developed and was in Kentucky called the Choctaw Academy. That building, the first, that first building still standing today. It's, you know, old and historical site, but it still stands. So that, in essence, gives you a, another glimpse of Indian boarding schools and how it has evolved over the years, almost making a complete circle, whereas the tribes may have started their educational program, the federal government came in, now the tribes are predominantly the uh, overseer of the Indian education program throughout this country. And I know Oklahoma, uh, one of the larger Indian states in the country, and uh, we have these five Indian schools. But the majority of our students, of course, you know, attend local public schools. Even with that, I am happy to say that like in the Choctaw, uh, nation area, the 11 and a half counties in Choctaw Nation area, each public school is teaching the Choctaw language, an accredited program teaching the Choctaw language in the public schools. This could be done in every school in Oklahoma if, you know, the tribe so saw fit to do that. And certainly a, a step to preserving the language, which is fast, that we're fast losing. I hope I didn't bore you too much, but I thank Julie and, and Sarah. Uh, so if you ever want to hear me say anything again, we'll talk to these two. They know where to find me. <laughs> thank you. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Baker? Karina? Oh, yeah. um, here, I grew up with stories from my family of, of that, um, and it actually was my uncles who were code talkers, Albert Smith and George yeah. Smith, who um, I was drawn to their stories of war, actually, in the military, but when I asked them, you know, about, board, uh, about the military, about World War II, my uncle would talk a lot about his time in boarding school. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of turned my interest to, wait a minute, why is he talking so much about this time? He talked about other things too, but he talked about how he had to talk the rocks and sticks in his language to mm -hmm. you know, keep that. And then later 
I notice there is, and I come across it too, the uh, complications, the complexities of indigenous and Native American boarding school experiences. And I found it even where I've interviewed a Navajo woman who went to boarding school in her community. There were boarding schools you know, right in Navajo country, right. like the Luke boarding school. And she said she hated it there. They told her she was stupid, she couldn't be anything. And then she went to Chiloco, went uh, to Oklahoma, you know, uh, away, or yes, that's right, uh, away for school, and said she loved it there. And that that's where she was able to get involved in clubs and different things like that. So even in one person, like their experiences, all these boarding schools, they're different, the different um, environments they, they're involved in. Um, now I'm working on a project about Inner Mountain, and I hear about um, the, the night terror that happened with the raids and rapes that happened in the blackout one time. And then I meet people who say they loved it. They're angry. The school's closed now, and they think everyone should have gone to it. Right? So there's these very, even within a school, there's these very different yeah. experiences. How, what do you recommend, what do you advise about how to navigate that? These, even extremes it is at some cases of I'm trying to best, you know, walk on eggshells sometimes about not disqualifying another story, another memory, because they are so different. Well, like, yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you both for sharing these. I know of course, I think, I think every boarding school has had experiences of almost everything. The quantity of those experiences, which outweighs which? The negative outweigh the positive experiences? The positive experience, does it outweigh the negative experiences? If so, then of course this is what I focus on. Of course, as a former administrator at Chilaco, yes, there were a number of experiences that I don't care to talk about. Uh, I'm really surprised that I even got up here and talked about, you know, what I talked about. Because <laughs> uh, I'm sort of the quiet person, I guess you would say, and I don't talk about anything, and then all of a sudden I might open up and you know, and start talking. And I have come across exactly what you're talking about. Uh, one thing I've noticed, and I don't want to pick on Navajos, but <laughs> a Navajo is harder on another Navajo than a non-Navajo is. I saw this in our military exercises. You take a military sergeant that's a Navajo, and I felt sorry for those privates who were Navajos. But yet, they did some wonderful things. For example, uh, at Fort Hood, Texas, we had about six Navajos in our platoon. And uh, we got the bright idea that we would be code talkers again. So we gave the Navajos, you know, the radios. And the other units had radios. They had the same, we're on our frequency, but they couldn't understand what these Navajos were saying. So, you know, that's the good experience, of, you know, that I saw. Uh, but again, going back to what you said, if the good outweighs the bad, then, you know, let's talk about the good stuff, but let's not neglect, you know, to sh show the whole pictures. And, and, uh, and, you know, this is what we've attempted to do. I work with Betty and, and uh, Charmaine, my wife, and Bill as a part of the Shalako Veterans, Alumni Veterans Committee. And we are attempting to, uh, with Julie and Sarah's assistants, now with Fire Thief Productions, that they were here this morning, to do the veteran story. And 
what they say, you know, we're not limiting that. And some of them will talk maybe negatively, but the majority of them are going to talk, you know, from the positive aspect. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but, you know, that's true. And uh, I've seen all of it, I guess you could say, at Trelaco as the former administrator, even to the point of experiencing death on campus uh, of our students or staff. And that's not the greatest experience, uh, experiencing, you know, students dying on campus. Which brings me up to another comment. You know, there's a graveyard, a cemetery at Shalako. And we will be honoring, you know, those that are buried there at our annual reunion. And, and the Washer man has been instrumental in, in uh, taking the lead role in that. So uh, hopefully we'll, uh, uh, you know, do what's right in honoring those that are buried there. Any other questions, sir? I hope I, I hope I answered your question to some extent. Yeah. I I need to come over there. I'm a I'm a guy that doesn't like to hear hard hearing. I guess you could say. I just want to tell you, thank you so much for coming. I'm sure your mother's so proud of you. Um, <laughs> I, but I was wondering, um, you were mentioning the Code Talkers. Uh, do you think Charles Chibetty, is he an alumni from your school? He is a Haskell. Oh, Haskell Nation. Yes. And speaking of Haskell, what I wondered is with Haskell Nation starting out as boarding school and then junior college and now four year four university, year could that happen with Chilaco if there was the interest? No. There is a language that still exists in federal law that says no money shall ever be used for educational purposes at Shalako Indian School. Mm -hmm. And every year <clears throat> they keep that language in there. So <clears throat> I doubt it very seriously that it would ever happen. It would cost about $80 million now to refurbish the campus. So. Well, the, uh, the campus was, through uh, an act of Congress, it was uh, turned over to the five tribes in that area. Uh, each tribe received 800 acres, and then the main campus, 165 acres, is jointly owned by these five tribes, and they've leased it out to uh, uh, an OSU entity, uh, University Multispectral Laboratory, and they are doing some uh, work there, uh, contract work out there. So it, it's, fortunately, they've helped, you know, keep all of the buildings from falling apart. So that, that much we're thankful for. Now, buildings are falling apart. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. It's falling apart, but but, you know, when a building is neglected over years, it will do that. And then, of course, fracking around this part of the country doesn't help. I'm not saying fracking is doing it, but I'll say it probably is. <laughs> Bill? Charlie? Anybody know about Charlie? That is Charlie Company that was located as a National Guard unit on campus. Uh, when it was 180th Infantry, it went to World War II, and Ernest Childers and, of course, Jack Montgomery went along with it when it was activated. During the Korean War, it was 279th Infantry, and then 179th, which located, uh, I think it was in Edmond, was also activated, and then Sherlocko became uh, 179th uh, shortly thereafter. The good thing about 179th is that we have some legacy there. Uh, we have a little rubber Indian doll mascot that sits on the guide on, that sat on the guide on. It went through the Korean War, sitting on the guide on. The 
division commanders uh, who was in charge of uh, the combat operations uh, ordered the rubber, rubber mascot doll to be taken off the guide on because it was not a military issue. The uh, Colonel uh, Hillman, I think was his name, went to battle, uh, went to bat for Charlie Company. And when he made the appeal, the Corps commander came back with an order that the rubber mascot would remain on the guidon. So it went through the Korean War sitting on top of the guidon. And of course, during the Korean War, then a third Company C member was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was not a Shalako student. He was an Eastern Cherokee who had a regular army who had been assigned uh, to Company C. So that, another notoriety. Another notoriety of Company C is that Hoss Cartwright, anybody ever hear of Hoss Cartwright? Bonanza? He was a part of the unit. So, you know, we could go on and on. <laughs> Looking for the what? How they came into boot, how they were when they went to boot camp. Oh. <laughs> well, going to a boarding school, I think any boarding school for that matter, made it, made boot camp a breeze. <laughs> because, you know, we knew how to fix our beds. We knew how to mop up the floor, how to clean the, the, you know, the mess we made, how to fold our clothes and how to do our own laundry. So when we went to boot camp, I mean, it was a breeze. Uh, so when they would give us 15 minute break, we'd be out there throwing football or playing ball, razzing each other. And all the other guys from New York, Boston, et cetera, they'd be sitting there writing love letters some of them would be crying, you know. <laughs> and we were out there just having fun. And we, th we thought that's the way it's supposed to be. Well, thank you all for coming today. We have more questions. We invite you to talk to our presenters individually. Um, we have a number of Chilaco images that we collected with the help of this group that are available online at the Texas Oklahoma University Library. I did notice the dis I did notice the display downstairs, uh, the uh, Patriot Nations display. Uh, we contributed to that, and uh, we will be showing that same display during our reunion this year. And uh, come out and see us. <laughs>